The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, translated by the Reverend William Benham. The first book, Admonitions Profitable for the Spiritual Life, chapters 21 to 25. Chapter 21 Of Compunction of Heart If thou wilt make any progress, keep thyself in the fear of God, and long not to be too free, but restrain all thy senses under discipline, and give not thyself up to senseless mirth. Give thyself to compunction of heart, and thou shalt find devotion. Compunction openeth the way for many good things, which dissoluteness is wont quickly to lose. It is wonderful that any man can ever rejoice heartily in this life, who considereth and waiteth his banishment, and the manifold dangers which beset his soul. Through lightness of heart and neglect of our shortcomings, we feel not the sorrows of our soul, but often vainly laugh when we have good cause to weep. There is no true liberty, nor real joy, save in the fear of God with a good conscience. Happy is he who can cast away every cause of distraction, and bring himself to the one purpose of holy compunction. Happy is he who putteth away from him whatsoever may stain or burden his conscience. Strive manfully. Custom is overcome by custom. If thou knowest how to let men alone, they will gladly let thee alone to do thine own works. Busy not thyself with the affairs of others, nor entangle thyself with the business of great men. Keep always thine eye upon thyself first of all, and give advice to thyself specially before all thy dearest friends. If thou hast not the favour of men, be not thereby cast down, but let thy concern be that thou holdest not thyself so well and circumspectly as becometh a servant of God and a devout monk. It is often better and safer for a man not to have many comforts in this life, especially those which concern the flesh. But that we lack divine comforts or feel them rarely is to our own blame, because we seek not compunction of heart, nor utterly cast away those comforts which are vain and worldly. Know thyself to be unworthy of divine consolation, and worthy rather of much tribulation. When a man hath perfect compunction, then all the world is burdensome and bitter to him. A good man will find sufficient cause for mourning and weeping, for whether he considereth himself, or pondereth concerning his neighbour, he knoweth that no man liveth here without tribulation, and the more thoroughly he considereth himself, the more thoroughly he grieveth. Grounds for just grief and inward compunction there are in our sins and vices, wherein we lie so entangled that we are but seldom able to contemplate heavenly things. If thou thoughtest upon thy death more often than how long thy life should be, thou wouldest doubtless strive more earnestly to improve. And if thou didst seriously consider the future pains of hell, I believe thou wouldest willingly endure toil or pain and fear not discipline. But because these things reach not the heart, and we still love pleasant things, therefore we remain cold and miserably indifferent. Oftentimes it is from poverty of spirit that the wretched body is so easily led to complain. Pray therefore humbly unto the Lord that he will give thee the spirit of compunction and say in the language of the prophet, Feed me, O Lord, with bread of tears, 
and give me plenteousness of tears to drink. Psalm 75, verse 5 Chapter 22 On the Contemplation of Human Misery Thou art miserable wheresoever thou art, and whithersoever thou turnest, unless thou turn thee to God. Why art thou disquieted, because it happeneth not to thee according to thy wishes and desires? Who is he that hath everything according to his will? Neither I, nor thou, nor any man upon the earth. There is no man in the world free from trouble or anguish, though he were king or pope. Who is he who hath the happiest lot? Even he who is strong to suffer somewhat for God. There are many foolish and unstable men who say, See what a prosperous life that man hath, how rich and how great he is, how powerful, how exalted. But lift up thine eyes to the good things of heaven, and thou shalt see that all these worldly things are nothing. They are utterly uncertain. Yes, they are for wearisome, because they are never possessed without care and fear. The happiness of man lieth not in the abundance of temporal things, but a moderate portion sufficeth him. Our life upon the earth is verily wretchedness. The more a man desireth to be spiritual, the more bitter doth the present life become to him, because he the better understandeth and seeth the defects of human corruption. For to eat, to drink, to watch, to sleep, to rest, to labour, and to be subject to the other necessities of nature, is truly a great wretchedness and affliction to a devout man, who would fain be released and free from all sin. For the inner man is heavily burdened with the necessities of the body in this world. Wherefore the prophet devoutly prayeth to be freed from them, saying, Deliver me from my necessities, O Lord. Psalm 25, verse 17 But woe to those who know not their own misery, and yet greater woe to those who love this miserable and corruptible life. For to such a degree do some cling to it, even though by labouring or begging they scarce procure what is necessary for subsistence, that if they might live here always, they would care nothing for the kingdom of God. O foolish and faithless of heart, who lie buried so deep in worldly things, that they relish nothing save the things of the flesh, miserable ones, they will too sadly find out at last how vile and worthless was that which they loved. The saints of God and all loyal friends of Christ held as nothing the things which pleased the flesh, or those which flourish in this life, but their whole hope and affection aspired to the things which are above. Their whole desire was borne upwards to everlasting and invisible things, lest they should be drawn downwards by the love of things visible. Lose not, brother, thy loyal desire of progress to things spiritual. There is yet time, the hour is not past. Why wilt thou put off thy resolution? Arise, begin this very moment, and say, Now is the time to do, now is the time to fight, now is the proper time for amendment. When thou art ill at ease and troubled, then is the time when thou art nearest unto blessing. Thou must go through fire and water, that God may bring thee into a wealthy place. Unless thou put force upon thyself, thou wilt not conquer thy faults. So long as we carry about with us this frail body, we cannot be without sin, we cannot live without weariness and trouble. 
gladly would we have rest from all misery, but because through sin we have lost innocence, we have lost also the true happiness. Therefore must we be patient and wait for the mercy of God until this tyranny be overpassed and this mortality be swallowed up of life. Oh, how great is the frailty of man which is ever prone to evil! Today thou confessest thy sins, and tomorrow thou committest again the sins thou didst confess. Now dost thou resolve to avoid a fault, and within an hour thou behavest thyself as if thou hadst never resolved at all. Good cause have we therefore to humble ourselves, and never to think highly of ourselves, seeing that we are so frail and unstable. And quickly may that be lost by our negligence, which by much labour was hardly attained through grace. What shall become of us at the end, if at the beginning we are lukewarm and idle? Woe unto us if we choose to rest, as though it were a time of peace and security, while as yet no sign appeareth in our life of true holiness. Rather had we need that we might begin yet afresh, like good novices, to be instructed unto good living, if haply there might be hope of some future amendment and greater spiritual increase. Chapter 23 of Meditation Upon Death Very quickly will there be an end of thee here. Take heed, therefore, how it will be with thee in another world. Today man is, and tomorrow he will be seen no more. And being removed out of sight, quickly also is he out of mind. O oh, the dullness and hardness of man's heart, which thinketh only of the present, and looketh not forward to the future. Thou oughtest in every deed and thought, so to order thyself, as if thou wert to die this day. If thou hadst a good conscience, thou wouldst not greatly fear death. It were better for thee to watch against sin, than to fly from death. If today thou art not ready, how shalt thou be ready tomorrow? Tomorrow is an uncertain day, and how knowest thou that thou shalt have a tomorrow? What doth it profit to live long, when we amend so little? Ah, long life doth not always amend, but often the more increaseth guilt. O oh, that we might spend a single day in this world as it ought to be spent! Many there are who reckon the years since they were converted, and yet oftentimes how little is the fruit thereof. If it is a fearful thing to die, it may be perchance a yet more fearful thing to live long. Happy is the man who hath the hour of his death always before his eyes, and daily prepareth himself to die. If thou hast ever seen one die, consider that thou also shalt pass away by the same road. When it is morning, reflect that it may be that thou shalt not see the evening, and at eventide dare not to boast thyself of the morrow. Always be thou prepared, and so live that death may never find thee unprepared. Many die suddenly and unexpectedly, for at such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, verse 44 When that last hour shall come, thou wilt begin to think very differently of thy whole life past, and wilt mourn bitterly that thou hast been so negligent and slothful. Happy and wise is he who now striveth to be such in life as he would fain be found in death. For a perfect contempt of the world, a fervent desire to excel in virtue, 
the love of discipline, the painfulness of repentance, readiness to obey, denial of self, submission to any adversity for love of Christ, these are the things which shall give great confidence of a happy death. Whilst thou art in health, thou hast many opportunities of good works, but when thou art in sickness, I know not how much thou wilt be able to do. Few are made better by infirmity, even as they who wander much abroad seldom become holy. Trust not thy friends and kinsfolk, nor put off the work of thy salvation to the future, for men will forget thee sooner than thou thinkest. It is better for thee now to provide in time and to send some good before thee, than to trust to the help of others. If thou art not anxious for thyself now, who, thinkest thou, will be anxious for thee afterwards? Now the time is most precious, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. But alas, that thou spendest not well this time, wherein thou mightest lay up treasure which should profit thee everlastingly. The hour will come when thou shalt desire one day, yea, one hour, for amendment of life, and I know not whether thou shalt obtain. O dearly beloved, from what danger thou mightest free thyself, from what great fear, if only thou wouldst always live in fear, and in expectation of death. Strive now to live in such wise that in the hour of death thou mayest rather rejoice than fear. Learn now to die to the world, so shalt thou begin to live with Christ. Learn now to condemn all earthly things, and then mayest thou freely go unto Christ. Keep under thy body by penitence, and then shalt thou be able to have a sure confidence. Ah, foolish one, why thinkest thou that thou shalt live long, when thou art not sure of a single day? How many have been deceived, and suddenly have been snatched away from the body? How many times hast thou heard how one was slain by the sword, another was drowned, another falling from on high broke his neck, another died at the table, another whilst at play. One died by fire, another by the sword, another by the pestilence, another by the robber. Thus cometh death to all, and the life of men swiftly passeth away like a shadow. Who will remember thee after thy death, and who will entreat for thee? Work, work now, O dearly beloved, work all that thou canst, for thou knowest not when thou shalt die, nor what shall happen unto thee after death. While thou hast time, lay up for thyself undying riches, think of naught but of thy salvation, care only for the things of God, make to thyself friends, by venerating the saints of God, and walking in their steps, that when thou failest, thou mayest be received unto everlasting habitations. Luke 16, verse 9 Keep thyself as a stranger and a pilgrim upon the earth, to whom the things of the world appertain not. Keep thine heart free and lifted up towards God, from here have we no continuing city. Hebrews 13, verse 14 To him direct thy daily prayers with crying and tears, that thy spirit may be found worthy to pass happily after death unto its Lord. Amen. Chapter 24 of the judgment and punishment of the wicked. In all that thou doest, remember the end, 
and how thou wilt stand before a strict judge, from whom nothing is hid, who is not bribed with gifts, nor accepteth excuses, but will judge righteous judgment. O most miserable and foolish sinner, who art sometimes in fear of the countenance of an angry man, what wilt thou answer to God, who knoweth all thy misdeeds? Why dost thou not provide for thyself against the day of judgment, when no man shall be able to be excused or defended by means of another, but each one shall bear his burden himself alone? Now doth thy labour bring forth fruit, now is thy weeping acceptable, thy groaning heard, thy sorrow well-pleasing to God and cleansing to thy soul. Even here on earth the patient man findeth great occasion of purifying his soul. When suffering injuries he grieveth more for the other's malice than for his own wrong. When he prayeth heartily for those that despitefully use him, and forgiveth them from his heart, when he is not slow to ask pardon from others, when he is swifter to pity than to anger, when he frequently denieth himself, and striveth altogether to subdue the flesh to the spirit. Better is it now to purify the soul from sin, than to cling to sins from which we must be purged hereafter. Truly we deceive ourselves by the inordinate love which we bear towards the flesh. What is it which that fire shall devour, save thy sins? The more thou sparest thyself, and followest the flesh, the more heavy shall thy punishment be, and the more fuel art thou heaping up for the burning. For wherein a man hath sinned, therein shall he be the more heavily punished. There shall the slothful be pricked forward with burning goads, and the gluttons be tormented with intolerable hunger and thirst. There shall the luxurious and the lovers of pleasure be plunged into burning pitch and stinking brimstone and the envious shall howl like mad dogs for very grief. No sin will there be which shall not be visited with its own proper punishment. The proud shall be filled with utter confusion, and the covetous shall be pinched with miserable poverty. An hour's pain there shall be more grievous than a hundred years here of the bitterest penitence. No quiet shall be there, no comfort for the lost, though here sometimes there is respite from pain and enjoyment of the solace of friends. Be thou anxious now and sorrowful for thy sins, that in the day of judgment thou mayest have boldness with the blessed. For then shall the righteous man stand in great boldness before the face of such as have afflicted him, and made no account of his labours. Wisdom 5 verse 1 Then shall he stand up to judge, he who now submitteth himself in humility to the judgments of men. Then shall the poor and humble man have great confidence, while the proud is taken with fear on every side. Then shall it be seen that he was the wise man in this world who learned to be a fool and despised for Christ. Then shall all tribulation patiently borne delight us, while the mouth of the ungodly shall be stopped. Then shall every godly man rejoice, and every profane man shall mourn. Then the afflicted flesh shall more rejoice than if it had been always nourished in delights. Then the humble garment shall put on beauty, and the precious robe shall hide itself as vile. Then the little poor cottage shall be more commended than the gilded palace. Then enduring patience shall have more might than all the power of the world. Then simple obedience 
shall be more highly exalted than all worldly wisdom. Then a pure and good conscience shall more rejoice than learned philosophy. Then contempt of riches shall have more weight than all the treasure of the children of this world. Then shalt thou find more comfort in having prayed devoutly than in having fared sumptuously. Then thou wilt rather rejoice in having kept silence than in having made long speech. Then holy deeds shall be far stronger than many fine words. Then a strict life and sincere penitence shall bring deeper pleasure than all earthly delight. Learn now to suffer a little, that then thou mayest be enabled to escape heavier sufferings. Prove first here what thou art able to endure hereafter. If now thou art able to bear so little, how wilt thou be able to endure eternal torments? If now a little suffering maketh thee so impatient, what shall hellfire do then? Behold of a surety, thou art not able to have two paradises, to take thy fill or delight here in this world, and to reign with Christ hereafter. If even unto this day thou hadst ever lived in honours and pleasures, what would the whole profit thee, if now death came to thee in an instant? All, therefore, is vanity, save to love God and to serve Him only. For he who loveth God with all his heart feareth not death, nor punishment, nor judgment, nor hell, because perfect love giveth sure access to God. But he who still delighteth in sin, no marvel if he is afraid of death and judgment. Nevertheless it is a good thing, if love as yet cannot restrain thee from evil, that at least the fear of hell should hold thee back. But he who putteth aside the fear of God cannot long continue in good, but shall quickly fall into the snares of the devil. Chapter 25 Of the Zealous Amendment of Our Whole Life Be thou watchful and diligent in God's service, and bethink thee often why thou hast renounced the world. Was it not that thou mightest live to God, and become a spiritual man? Be zealous, therefore, for thy spiritual profit, for thou shalt receive shortly the reward of thy labours, and neither fear nor sorrow shall come any more into thy borders. Now shalt thou labour a little, and thou shalt find great rest, yea, everlasting joy. If thou shalt remain faithful and zealous in labour, Doubt not that God shall be faithful and bountiful in rewarding thee. It is thy duty to have a good hope that thou wilt attain the victory, but thou must not fall into security, lest thou become slothful or lifted up. A certain man, being in anxiety of mind, continually tossed about between hope and fear, and being on a certain day overwhelmed with grief, cast himself down in prayer before the altar in a church, and meditated within himself, saying, Oh, if I but knew that I should still persevere! And presently heard within him a voice from God, And if thou didst know it, what wouldst thou do? Do now what thou wouldst do then, and thou shalt be very secure. And straightway, being comforted and strengthened, he committed himself to the will of God, and the perturbation of spirit ceased. Neither had he a mind any more to search curiously to know what should befall him hereafter, but studied rather to inquire what was the good and acceptable will of God for the beginning and perfecting 
of every good work. Hope in the Lord, and be doing good, saith the prophet. Dwell in the land, and thou shalt be fed with its riches. Psalm 37, verse 3. One thing there is which holdeth back many from progress and fervent amendment, even the dread of difficulty or the labour of the conflict. Nevertheless, they advance above all others in virtue, who strive manfully to conquer those things which are most grievous and contrary to them. For there a man profiteth most, and meriteth great grace where he most overcometh himself, and mortifieth himself in spirit. But all men have not the same passions to conquer and to mortify. Yet he who is diligent shall attain more profit, although he have stronger passions, than another who is more temperate of disposition, but is withal less fervent in the pursuit of virtue. Two things especially avail unto improvement in holiness, namely, firmness to withdraw ourselves from the sin to which by nature we are most inclined, and earnest zeal for that good in which we are most lacking, and strive also very earnestly to guard against and subdue those faults which displease thee most frequently in others. Gather some profit to thy soul wherever thou art, and wherever thou seest or hearest good examples, stir thyself to follow them. But where thou seest anything which is blameworthy, take heed that thou do not the same, or if at any time thou hast done it, strive quickly to amend thyself. As thine eye observeth others, so again are the eyes of others upon thee. How sweet and pleasant is it to see zealous and godly brethren, temperate and of good discipline, and how sad is it and grievous to see them walking disorderly, not practising the duties to which they are called. How hurtful a thing it is to neglect the purpose of their calling, and turn their inclinations to things which are none of their business. Be mindful of the duties which thou hast undertaken, and set always before thee the remembrance of the crucified. Truly oughtest thou to be ashamed as thou lookest upon the life of Jesus Christ, because thou hast not yet endeavoured to conform thyself more unto him, though thou hast been a long time in the way of God. A religious man who exercises himself seriously and devoutly in the most holy life and passion of our Lord, shall find there abundantly all things that are profitable and necessary for him. Neither is there need that he shall seek anything better beyond Jesus. Oh, if Jesus crucified would come into our hearts, how quickly and completely should we have learned all that we need to know. He who is earnest receiveth and beareth well all things that are laid upon him. He who is careless and lukewarm hath trouble upon trouble, and suffereth anguish upon every side, because he is without inward consolation, and is forbidden to seek that which is outward. He who is living without discipline is exposed to grievous ruin, he who seeketh easier and lighter discipline shall always be in distress, because one thing or another will give him displeasure. O, oh, if no other duty lay upon us but to praise the Lord our God with our whole heart and voice! O, oh, if thou never hadst need to eat or drink or sleep, but were always able to praise God, and to give thyself to spiritual exercises alone, then shouldst thou be far happier than now, when for so many necessities thou must serve the flesh. 
Oh, that these necessities were not, but only the spiritual refreshments of the soul, which, alas, we taste too seldom. When a man hath come to this, that he seeketh comfort from no created thing, then doth he perfectly begin to enjoy God, then also will he be well contented with whatsoever shall happen unto him. Then will he neither rejoice for much, nor be sorrowful for little, but he committeth himself altogether and with full trust into God, who is all in all to him, to whom nothing perisheth nor dieth, but all things live to him and obey his every word without delay. Remember always thine end, and how the time which is lost returneth not. Without care and diligence thou shalt never get virtue. If thou beginnest to grow cold, it shall begin to go ill with thee. But if thou givest thyself unto zeal, thou shalt find much peace, and shalt find thy labour the lighter because of the grace of God, and the love of virtue. A zealous and diligent man is ready for all things. It is greater labour to resist sins and passions than to toil in bodily labours. He who shunneth not small faults falleth little by little into greater. At eventide thou shalt always be glad if thou spend the day profitably. Watch over thyself, stir thyself up, admonish thyself, and howsoever it be with others, neglect not thyself. The more violence thou dost unto thyself, the more thou shalt profit. Amen. End of the first book.